the minor of security, security challenges, challenges facing the nation are constantly mutating, mutating and are the five most known solutions. Solution. In, the, in phase the phase of the security, security, security challenge, challenge we face across the country, the country it is worth noting that the Nigerian Army, in, in conjunction with its sister services and other security agencies, has worked assiduously to ensure that all threats to our national security are contained. I believe that we will align the purpose between the government, the people, and our security agencies, we shall soon see light at the end of the tunnel of our security challenges. Considering the fact that the security situation in the country changes periodically, the Nigerian army has remained relentless in not only catching up with the fast-paced evolution of these security threats, but to even be stepped ahead of it. The Nigerian army will continue to ensure that every threat to our security is contained to allow for meaningful development across, across the, the nation. nation. We must train our to be able to, to effectively contain the security challenges facing our nation, nation and strengthen, strengthen our people's, people's confidence in government and its institutions. Okay, so we've got um, retired group captain Sadiq Shaw here with us. He's also a strategic security consultant. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today on the program. Good morning, Chamberlain. Good morning, Mariam. Good morning. Well, this matter that's been back and forth about, of course, it has to do with security. Uh, U.S., French bases coming to Nigeria or accepting them here. We've seen some certain uh, concerned citizens have written to the president. They say, please, we we'll advise the president, don't allow that to happen. In the light of what they've seen happen in Mali, uh, Niger, Burkina Faso, so they think they're lobbying Nigeria, Ghana, and some other countries to accept that base or those bases here. So they think, whoa, whoa, whoa. They went ahead and reeled out some disadvantages. Why we should not? I mean, haven't been in service. What do you think of this? Well, uh, thank you very much. First, uh, I would like to lay the premise that I think this debate mm -hmm. is uh, being, uh, you know, sounded out in many quarters. To my own knowledge, not because that any formal request has been made by the United States to Nigeria, but I think uh, the venerable statesmen that wrote uh, that paper, they are looking at possibilities. You know, after the expulsion of uh, the Americans and the French from Niger, from the other Francophone countries, uh, recently Chad, certainly the uh, West African Sahel region is very, very strategic to America and other Western countries. And as much as possible, they wouldn't like to leave that area without their presence for so many reasons. Some of these reasons are security related. Uh, you know, America has far flung interests. So they believe wherever there is terrorism or counterterrorism, before it gets to their borders, they should try and attack it as far away as possible. So, whether we, for good or bad, the West African Sahelian region has become the hotbed of ISWAP and many other, all the other associates of terrorist groups. So that is one interest for America. A second interest, you know, uh, unfortunately, contrary to African countries, Western countries, they do far-flung projections, many years projections. If there is instability in these regions, what concerns them is that there will be inflow of migrants to their countries, which will stretch their own social architecture. So anything they will do to ensure that the region is calm in the long run, they see it as their own national interest. You see, in these two things I mentioned, whichever country or African countries also, it's a, it's a, it is a mutually beneficial relationship because we too we don't want terrorism, we don't want instability. But having said that, in uh, international relations, you don't have to be naive. For anything that a country does, there is its own personal interest. Then what are those interests of America? The region also is rich in resources. They want to be there. So there is economic interest for Americans to be in the Sahel West African region. The third is great power influence. China and Russia and to some extent Iran are making inroads into that region. Americans would not like to be left behind. So basically, this is what pushes the thinking that if they are sent out of uh, 
Egypt, I mean, out of uh, Niger and other countries, they will still try to find other countries around that area to stay. And uh, reading papers, American stakeholders, you know, all these, all these uh, units that were dispelled from, uh, just, they are under what is called the uh, Africa Command, Africa Command, mm -hmm. which when it was started, when they started planning about it in 2007, actually, as the name implies, they want a command that will be in charge of Africa. African by designation, its uh, area of operation covers 53 out of the 54 African countries. So logistically, you can see the best place for that command to be is inside Africa. But in 2007, when the debate started, generally across Africa, the reception was very negative. African countries led by African Union and other regional, they didn't like, uh, you know, because there is vestiges of, uh, it is a neo-colonialist thing, mm. uh, you know, colonialism is coming back. So again, importantly, Nigeria, South Africa, Libya, which in the African Union, they are among the P5, or you can see, together with Egypt, they kicked against uh, African being staged in Africa. It is out of that that the American government placed it in uh, Germany instead of being on Africa. That was 2007. But even at that 2007, there were countries like Liberia who opted, who actually asked to be given the right to host this. Thing. But again, the influence of Nigeria, South Africa, Libya, and to some extent Egypt, you know, stopped all other smaller countries that wanted to really host this thing. They were convinced in the yeah. spirit of uh, this and that it is against African interest to have foreign bases in that. That was 2007, 2008. Was that our own position, Nigeria? I told you, Nigeria was among the countries that you actually no. weighed, yes, that actually so, weighed in on, uh, on the smaller countries that wanted to okay. accept. How do you then explain what happened in 2017? Exactly. So you oh, see, okay. again, uh, I know where you're going. It's an issue of, uh, sometimes when people will tell you that the international relation is dynamic, that is, can change from time to time. But having said that, I have also a different idea. There are some countries right now that you cannot even talk about the possibility of them putting an American base. Because throughout time, their stand is very, unfortunately, I don't know, maybe the uh, diplomats will not agree with me. Would the, would, would the, I mean, I mean would, in, in the aspect of having a foreign military base, unfortunately, Nigeria's foreign relations has not been consistent. Let's go back to 1960. After independence, Britain wanted to do an alliance with Nigeria. Mm -hmm. There was a big riot across Nigeria. Yeah. It was stopped. Then I tell you, this 2007, they wanted to do uh, uh, AFRICOM in Africa. Nigeria was among the countries that said no. Not only said no, weighed in on countries like Liberia not to accept. However, again, like you said, in uh, 20, 2016, uh, no, okay, is it 2021, we had President Mahmoud Buhari, Probably, some people say because of the realization that time that maybe we do not have the capacity to confront our decision. When uh, the Secretary of State came here, yeah. he asked Anthony him Blinken. that he is requesting for African command to be relocated in Africa. Yeah. I underline in Africa, he didn't go as far as to say so relocate in Nigeria. So well, what does that mean? Then? Where was he go was he going for another country? Uh, well, the fact that he even com compared to what Nigeria did in 2007 to now, what experts are seeing is a great divergence from where Nigeria was, and now accepting the presence. I told you it was Nigeria that actually discouraged, together with other countries, by the way. So this is the issue. At the African Union, in 2016 May, there was a meeting that was, uh, it, was, uh, it, it, was uh, it was held, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in Addis Ababa, 2016 May. What was the issue? The African Union Peace and Security Council was concerned about the proliferation of foreign military bases in Africa. So in as much as a regional organization, they cannot order countries, but they express their concern and warned African countries to be careful about accepting to host military bases. This is at the continental stage. So what I am saying over the years, while some countries have been, uh, you know, consistent against, Nigeria, sometimes initially it was against it, but now we are seeing. So like I said, I don't know if there's any formal request made to Nigeria. Now, what is foiling this debate is the fact that American uh, policymakers, they have uh, indicated a preference for a coastal West African country, without naming any country. They want a coastal West African country. So that is to say, even their choice of Niger was as a result of not getting that coastal West African country. Now there have been this, when you say coastal, I'll go along the Atlantic, you are taking of Nigeria, Ghana, Togo. Uh, Togo, Benin, so this is where they are. But if you ask me, this is my personal opinion. Given Nigeria's stance, 
you know, against uh, the, uh, the, the initial resistance. Mm -hmm. Despite what we heard during Buhari administration, despite this letter is saying, me, I am of the opinion that none of the big African countries, big, I say it in quotation marks, because every country is big in international relations. I don't think any of the big countries will agree to have an American base. Why? Because uh, it will be seen among African countries for whatever reason as given into colonial or new colonialist tendencies. Ghana has a history with Kwame Nkrumah. If you go back historically, Kwame Nkrumah in his book Neo Colonialism was the first to talk against having military bases in Africa. Then we have Gamal Abdul Nasser, we have uh, Gaddafi. All these people at one time or the other they spoke against it. In fact, in Ghana, currently there is a, a small, I will not call it a base, there's a presence of American troops in Takoraji Airport. But in 2018, when the Americans offered Ghana 20, $20 million, I think, to expand their presence, and the government was uh, gave the indication as if they will accept, there was a massive revolt from Ghanaians. And uh, Ghana now has to remember its uh, antecedents of Nkrumah, who has uh, fought colonialism. And again, the government, in fact, the, the president, uh, Nana, would, has to come out and make a statement that we never promise an American base. We will never promise an American base. Let's, let's talk a bit about that. Because, yes. you know, from, the, from this open letter mm. that was written by these northern elders, mm. they cited a few issues, you yes. know, saying, oh, we don't want the base here for certain reasons. Mm. Or oh, they said internal security to compromise mm -hmm. internal security, uh, increase mm. the living cost in those local areas. Mm -hmm. It's bad for the environment. When we set up these bases, it's not good for the environment. And most importantly, that... Um, in the places where these bases had existed before, there are no actual tangible, you know, solutions to the anti-terrorism war that they were set there for. You know, they're there, but these, these problems persist. Now, we've, we've seen all of these complaints. Are there any good sides to having a military base? And I'll tell you why. Because, you see, for the Nigerian, you know, we, we've been through a lot. So the concept of neocolonialism or, or the internal security, these are things that we may not like. However, we are fighting this asymmetrical warfare that has been on forever. And the non-kinetic solutions to this warfare are not in place right now. So for the Nigerian who's probably listening, what's wrong with them having a base here if they're going to help fight the insecurity that we're dealing with? Are there any good sides to this? Thank you very much. You know, when I'm talking about this since me, I look at it purely from the security point of view. What you said, probably some people have the opinion that's what made President Muhammad Buhari in 2016 being bedeviled by security, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 2021 actually, when he said Americans should bring the base back to Africa mm -hmm. so that he mentioned issue of uh, uh, logistics will be easier, you know, they will be, their eyes will be where it is happening. So, um, I must say you know, contrary to that, having Americans or any foreign distance, for the fact that in terms of uh, security capabilities, they have more than us. There are things they have that we don't have. However, the question is, even things like, uh, let's say, uh, satellite imagery, which they have helped our, our security forces with sometimes. They give the imagery we do not have. They can see where Boko Haram is. But even that, the problem is that it's not always. There are times that the Americans will get an intelligence but then in their own analysis, they will say that Nigerian security agencies, even if we give them the intelligence, they might misuse it. And they have all this, their Lee law and other laws, which is so, sometimes it is not even always when they get, I will give you an example. During the Iran, Iran bombing incident, people forget that it was the Americans who gave the initial information that there was a concentration. A concentration, yeah, words, words used are very, very important. Mm. There's a concentration around Iran. However, transmitting from the Americans to the Nigerians, concentration around Iran got translated as there is Boko Haram around Iran. So it was interpretation? It was interpretation. And the place was bombed. And as we know, 200, 300, depending on the figures, people were killed. And uh, if people recall, during the interview, Nigerian military officials, when they were under pressure, said, no, it is even Americans that gave us... Uh, that gave us this. So that thing actually even affected, I'm bringing back to Nigeria, it affected that flow of information. So the conclusion from Americans based on that incident was that, look, sometimes you even have to be careful what kind of information you give uh, your allies, depending on how they are this. And I think since then, uh, to my own knowledge, I think Americans have not been giving us what they call live intelligence. 
for them in love intelligence. If they see something, they might wait for some hours to pass before they pass it. So I'm bringing that to say that in as much as their presence could help us, but it's not guaranteed. It depends on their own perception, if the information is good. So that is one side. The second aspect of the goodness, even the American country, I told you they offered Ghana 20, 20 million or 20 billion accounts, 20, 20 something, you know, to expand their presence. The truth is that when Americans are there, they give a lot of money for any country. So now it depends. That's why I see more countries that are into it economically, more likely to, to offer the Americans. They give a lot of money. Of course, when the money comes, you know, uh, 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 contractors, because they have to use local contractors, so there are some economic benefits that will come. And of course, at the higher level, the fact that you are seen as an American ally might get you other things. Because whether we like it or not, they are a big economic power. Is that what affected Niger? Eh? Is that what might have affected Niger? Because if they give a lot of money, yes. for them to have pushed them out still, mm. they must have been This is what more. I'm telling you. The different countries have their interests. For some countries, they will only look at the economic benefit. You get the point? Some will look at the security benefit. Some will look at prestige. Why I talk about prestige? If a country is strong in the African region or mm -hmm. West African region, and it is claiming to be a leader, to my own understanding, there is some loss of prestige if you are seen to be hosting a foreign base in your country. I mean, prestige is all well and good, but, you know, I, I didn't quite get the answer that I was looking for. You mentioned a few of the benefits yes. that could be there. Yes. Yeah, but you, you have to be local. We have to localize it now to the Nigerian situation. Mm -hmm. With everything that's going on in the country, and I, I'll state it again, mm -hmm. the non-kinetic solutions to our asymmetrical warfare are not in place. And I hear the military say it all the time. Look, while we are doing these kinetic measures, the, the, the non-kinetic ones have to be dealt with. That's not being dealt with. In fact, the standard of living of the Nigerian has deteriorated. So we are looking at a situation where things will not get better if we continue at the pace at which we're going. Is there a way that having these bases in the country could give us an edge and put an end to this warfare? Well, I told you what they can do in terms of giving us intelligence, in terms of helping us to do the kinetic side. For the non-kinetics, when you talk about non-kinetics, you are talking about the condition of life mm -hmm. of the population. Mm -hmm. There is no foreign country that can do that for another country. That is an internal thing for the federal government, for the state government, for the National Assembly, to ensure that the non-kinetics, that's what the non-kinetics means. Mm -hmm. People should get jobs. People yeah, should so that's get, the point. Uh, yes. we don't, because we don't have those things yet. Yes. So which means that we are basically relying on the military uh, power yes. to be able to fight this. And so far, we're not making any headway there as well. Is there help needed that these bases can provide? The help that they can give, like I said, is on the security kinetic side. By giving us information, probably by giving us all equipment. But again, I emphasize, for the non-kinetic side, which has to do with the condition of living of the average Nigerian, it is not America that will do for us. It is not France that will do that for us. It is the Nigerian government and the Nigerian leaders that will provide that. All right. Let's bring in Ayo. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. uh, Captain, uh, it's good to see you again. But just one straight straight up question to you. Given the capacity of Nigeria's security apparatus, and I'm putting all of them in one basket right now, and given the successes that we hear that Nigerians always, Nigerian security apparatus always get the accolades that they get, the winnings that they achieve, uh, the capacity that they have, do you think Nigeria needs any Western country's military base in or around its country, from your experience? Well, uh, I would not like to answer that question with a yes or no. However, what I can do for you, if you ask me, is to tell you the pros and the cons. With regards to whether we can solve our security problem, we have been, I think from 2009 to now, our security problem has not been as it should be. Yes, our security forces are trying. Yes, they are, they are getting some successes as well as some reversals. But the truth is that we are still stuck with insecurity in the country. That is the reality as of today. When you do plus and minus, yes, benefits here, gains here, bandit skills here, uh, shakeout kills there. By and by, we are still in a ding-dong affair for this part 14 days. Mm. So if we have been talking, whether it is during the electioneering campaign by the president, whether it is from other sources, we agree to some extent, there is unanimity that our security architecture as it is now is not sufficient 
to arrest the problem. I don't think there's any longer any debate, for example, we don't have enough policemen. There's no debate about that. There is no longer any, 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 any uh, argument about the fact that we need more armed forces. When the, um, when the military men go to National Assembly, we hear them complaining of equipment. So definitely, there, is a gra there are gaps in capacity for our armed forces. And uh, now, whether we need Western support, we need Western support, not necessarily in a beast. We do not manufacture our weapons. If the Western countries do not give us weapons, what do you do? Our, our soldiers and policemen, are they going to fight with the tabs? So definitely, we need Western, we do Western support. Western support, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It could be part to have a military base here, but not necessarily that. Even the goodwill of these countries. You remember, if you go back to the Tucano, Tucano, based on uh, international listing, it was originally even a Brazilian aircraft. But because there are American parts that were used, they had an agreement with the uh, Brazilians that you cannot sell to any country unless we agree. So when we wanted to buy from Brazil, they blocked it. We still have to. So these are how these things work. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely, at the level we are, or at the level of where most countries are, the truth is that we need support for our, uh, you know, well, for our security. It, it uh, is understood, uh, Group Captain, that there is no but, nation yes. that it's uh, that is an island. However, maybe I should ask you yep. straight up, because uh, this conversation has also gone on for quite a bit. There are those who are wondering whether or not the security challenges we have, including security, uh, the military, some military personnel have also spoken to whether or not the security challenges we have are purely security issues or some of them are tainted with politics. We've heard uh, officials of government, be it in the security apparatus or even in, the, in ministries, departments and agencies, say that some of the challenges we are having are largely, more, they are more criminal than even a threat or terrorism in the, in the, in the real sense of it. The, the uh, chief of army staff, I think, was the one that we spoke earlier and spoke to the same thing. So is it something that cannot be dealt with by significant consultations among critical stakeholders because we have heard governors themselves complain that some powerful forces are working in the country against the interest of the, the, the security of the country so are these conversations difficult that we have to be even discussing that some foreign organization is going to have its own base here in nigeria security base here in nigeria other than they're having their own um, embassies and all well, uh, personally, I'm a, I'm a man of evidence. When I hear people uh, bringing some uh, conspiracy theories without actually naming people, I tend to prove that. What I would like to say as a security consultant is that we have security challenges currently, which our current security architecture is not up to the standard of meeting those challenges. That's how I look at it. When you look at the different actors in the insecurity, we have uh, terrorists like Boko Haram and Iswap, who we know their own is ideological. Ideological is based on ideology. That is why they don't uh, mind, uh, uh, you know, committing suicide or carrying a, an ED and going exploding this and other people. But again, when we come to banditry and other kidnapping and the rest, we have people who are in it for the money. For them, there is no uh, nothing uh, doctrinal or anything religious. It is purely money. So, but all these things, what do they mean to the average Nigerian? Is lack of security. Whether the man is uh, doing it for religious purpose whether the man is doing for one purpose, to the average Nigerian, the equation finally sums up to you are not safe. And unless you can do that, now talking about uh, conversation, conversation, there is a limit to what conversation can do. But if you are security access, if you are police, if you are military, are uh, not up to the standard to meet that, scene, no matter how many, how many meetings, in fact, in this last one month, how many meetings have we had? Whether abroad, whether here, by Senate, by police, everybody has done meetings. But what do we do? Have we moved? We have not moved. How long have we been saying that, okay, give it to the police, they have started, I've seen recruitment going. But even the recruitment, the numbers they are doing, is not the numbers that we are told will be appropriate. The, the military... Group Captain, yes. just so we don't go off what mm. we are. Mm. Because his question was specific, and I, I, I want to give some background to it. He was talking mm. about the, the governor of Katsina State, yes. Governor Diko Urada, who recently said yeah. that it is a business. I want to quote him. He says, it's a, now it has turned out to be a business venture. He was talking about banditry. He said, a business venture for the criminals, some who are in government, and some people who are in security outfits, and some people who are responsible for the day-to-day -day activities of their people. He said it here. Yes, he said it here, but uh, with due respect to the governor, this is what I said. Me, I'm a man of evidence. If a governor is talking that there are people in government, and he's not giving us, he's not uh, talking about them, 
for me, honest, I would just see it's just frustration with uh, the security situation. Are you supposed to have named, uh, named them? Of course, yes. <laughs> then who else is going to name them? Who else is going to name them? We do respect. We have even had presidents saying they have uh, Boko Haram sympathizers in there. To me, I think that's an irresponsible statement if you don't go ahead and name how far up do we need to go before we say who those people are. So to me, they still remain as uh, statements that are made out of frustration. When things are not working, you want to transfer the blame. That is how I see it. So how about this one? Mm -hmm. When um, a certain private, Muhammad Adamu, who is said to be in a second division, was reported to have killed the woman who was a repentant Boko Haram person. So and then last week as well, we also severally reported, several platforms also reported that mm -hmm. equally, that Repentant Boko Haram persons attacked the police station in Borno, trying to free some of their members who were held, and police said we repel them. So we also have heard the governor of Borno said at some point, say, look, these repentant Boko Haram persons, they end up as spies, and that he didn't support the idea. Well, you brought uh, three, in three or four instances, but each of them, they are, they are similar, but they are not the same. Uh, let's start with the soldier that was said to have killed somebody. He's in Baden, also somewhere in the southwest, he killed a lady and he was arrested. To the best of my knowledge, and uh, honestly, even having served with the military in doing my own security, I like to be independent and go on my own. This uh, rumor that repentant Boko Harams have been recruited into the Nigerian army, there is no single shred of evidence about it. Yes, there are repentant Boko Harams, but I am not aware. And all the people that are saying, trace all the news. What they say is that... Mm -hmm. They don't recruit them directly, no. Okay. That this person joined the civilian JTF, mm -hmm. from which they then get into the army. Mm -hmm. In fact, the officials there who were, they didn't want to be named, they mm -hmm. said, look, we, these are the people who we work with on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. We know how it works. The army can deny all they want, mm -hmm. but we know them and they are where with us. That they were former Boko Haram? Yes. And then before they went to the JTF? Before civilian well, JTF, I get that. then but, go into the army. Okay. But because before I've heard that uh, repentant Boko Harams, I've been recruited. I do not know of that. And I have not seen any evidence of that. Now, with the but, issue of... But you of, know the CJ, civilian JTF? Civilian JTF. Who goes no, to I will talk, not in particular, I will talk in general. You see, this issue of uh, repentant or uh, the radicalization, or, again, we have to understand it under the basis of international humanitarian law or international, uh, or because law of armed conflict or law of war, no matter, it's still the same thing. What does it say? There is a difference between an international war and an ingrown war. What's international law? International law is like we are having uh, 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 Israel fighting Hamas. These are two different countries. Or uh, Russia and, uh, and uh, what is the other country? Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and Ukraine fighting. That's an international law. What is it? How do you end such international law? It's very easy. During the war, you catch my prisoners, I catch your prisoners, you kill some, I kill some. At the end of it, when we agree to sign peace, you carry your people back to your country, you also release my own prisoner exchange. It is more difficult with an international, I mean, with an internal conflict. Mm. Why? Because the person you are fighting is also a citizen. You get the point? And unfortunately, there is no internal conflict that will end with the result that all Boko Haram members have been killed. So it's good to recruit some of them? Not to recruit me. What the, what the international law says, not to recruit, this uh, 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 the radicalization should be done at the end of the conflict for fear of what is happening. So we didn't do it right then? We didn't do it right. I must say that. We didn't do it right. Well, it, it is, a, it is, a, it is a, a requirement in the Geneva Convention Additional Protocol 2. Because it some... says amnesty at the end. The only problem I always have with that, can we say we are at the end of the conflict? And why do we experts do that? First, they realize you cannot tell the people that they are no longer Nigerians under the law. You cannot say if they surrender or they, that you will still come and kill them. Unless, of course, if you take them to court and court gives them... Uh, a death sentence. You get the point? So what is the way out? At the end of the, at the end of the decision, so that there is no chances of them going back to rejoin what is called recidivism. That is, they don't go back and rejoin where they are fighting. So I think the only slight problem we had with this radicalization, based on what we are seeing, is the timing. Because if the conflict is still going on, and there yeah, are but, still Boko Haram in the but bush, there is tendency. But what the terrorism law that says you have to prosecute those people? I, 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 what I am saying uh, about, hey, okay. You see, the thing is, is I mean, it's one thing that is it's a vicious circle. If you recall, the first set of Boko Harams that uh, were tried in Kayenji, I think, uh, I can't remember the year, 
the first trial, what happened at the trial? About 400 of them were discharged and acquitted. I, and I remember that there's an explanation for this, isn't it? That yes. there are different levels of terrorism, isn't it? Someone that was no, fetching, not no, it's not someone that was level. fetching, that was providing petrol. It's not, even that. It's not, it's even not the same as mm -hmm. someone that shot it's a gun. It's not even that. It's not even that. Yes, there is that, but that wasn't the case. The major case of releasing those people was that some were held in detention for over 10 years without prosecution. Mm. For that period of detention, you didn't uh, safeguard any evidence. You get the point? Now you bring them to court. We have to remember the judiciary is independent. I supposed to render justice to everybody. And there is this that lawyers will tell you or judicial people will tell you, if there is any doubt, you resolve it All right. in favor of the accused. So if you are so, not able to bring uh, evidence, those people were, were released. So we had problem of even say the prosecution, our success of prosecuting Boko Haram has been very low. And who do you blame for that? But the law is the law. The, no, but if the, 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 the court cannot just help you because they are Boko Haram and then... So you have to do it right. You have to do it right. If you don't prepare your case, if you don't bring the evidence, the court will release them. So, but definitely, in conclusion, mm. now that they are raising this alarm, this question, these concerns all over the place, mm. it's increasing now of mm. rep so-called repentant Boko Haram persons in, in the service mm. attacking different formations. Mm. We need to find a way to look, have a look at this. If it's happening time and again, we, should, we need to have another look what actually happened. How but, do we correct this? Permit me to see, even that, to be honest to me, to me now, there's no conclusive evidence. The story is out there yeah. that these people, that these things were caught, uh, repentant Boko Haram who entered the army through civilian JTF. I think if we are responsible people, there are certain agencies or government levels that should go right. and confirm that this is actually okay. so. So we'll, we'll look to that and see how we proceed from there. Moving forward, Group Captain Sadiq Shehu, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Thank you very much.